Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Tinde and I am an expert in survivor-centered policy uh, and practice and I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am also one of the guest curators for the Anti-Slavery Knowledge Network and I pride myself in being both a survivor leader in this space and a protection practitioner and most of my perspectives in this conversation are going to be based primarily on those two lenses. Freedom is one of those words that we have used so many times and we are at a point where its definition is a bit ambiguous sometimes when it's used. And especially in the human, uh, human trafficking sector where the word itself has a different meaning depending on who is defining it. For example, the process of rescue has been defined as freedom by many pr practitioners. This is mainly when a survivor leaves the situation of abuse, crisis or conflict and is no longer with their perpetrator. But this is not as easy as it sounds. And from the AKN projects, several survivors tended to think differently or reflect, reflected differently on rescue and its use in defining freedom. For example, in the All Red project, one of the survivors said, and I quote, I am free from the conflict now, but I don't believe that I am free. I do not feel free. We recognize that it's not, from this statement, it's not enough that people have left the experience or the crisis they are facing. And as practitioners, we do place a lot of emphasis on rescue of victims as a goal, when in reality, it is a small aspect of this definition of this broad word that we are calling freedom. The second thing, that we like to define as freedom is rehabilitation. This is the process, the steps, the different steps or services that practitioners give to survivors with a goal of helping them recover. It, it's again, it's something that when you speak to many practitioners, they'll define it as freedom. But yet again, from this project, this definition seems to be lacking. For example, in the University of Ghana project, where they were looking at both uh, contemporary forms of slavery and, uh, and slavery itself, one of the things they reflected on and they mentioned was the fact that children who had been rescued and rehabilitated and taken back to their communities went back to their traffickers because of lack of livelihood options. And this might come as a shock to many people, but it basically highlights what most of us know and have always said. And this is the assumption that trafficking is the worst form of abuse that someone has ever gone through. For some people, trafficking isn't the worst form of abuse. For some people, their situations of trafficking are better than situations that they face in and if our rehabilitation interventions are not trauma-informed to recognize this, then we'll keep failing in this business of freedom or in this business of defining freedom. From the Yolred project, a survivor mentions, and I quote, when captured and removed from the conflict, I was put into a rehabilitation center. The rehabilitation center was confusing and you feel lost and vulnerable. I received counseling, which trained me on how to live with society again, but it focused on being obedient more than dealing with the trauma. I left with a mattress, two saucepans and a bag of rice. This deal lasts very long. When you've survived captivity and slept on the earth, how important is a mattress? Again, this statement basically highlights some of the things that we commonly do as rehabilitation of survivors, which is placing survivors in rehabilitation centers or shelters, uh, counseling, 
and of course provision of basic needs when we take them back to uh, their communities. And as you can see, this also is not enough in defining freedom. It's not enough for some survivors. And this statement actually made me question a lot of things. It made me think about how we think about rehabilitation and how we administer rehabilitation. And most of our rehabilitation processes are focused on fixing the survivor. And I say fixing because what we do is actually say that survivors cannot exist as they are with their trauma in communities. And so most, some of the interventions we, we actually do might look like we are fixing the survivors rather than asking ourselves how the, the community can change in accommodating survivors. The process of reintegration is another one that is discussed as being part of freedom. So reunification with families is a key milestone and a key aspect of defining freedom and of defining some of the solutions that we give to, to modern slavery and trafficking. But in these projects, again, the, the definition seems more nuanced. From the Yolred project, a survivor said, again, I quote, returning home was difficult. I was welcomed by my immediate family, but not so much by other community members. I couldn't, I realized I couldn't stay with my community anymore as I didn't belong and they no longer wanted me. I was stigmatized because of the actions of the Lord's resistance and they were not my actions. And that's the thing, when we focus, I go back to my discussion on rehabilitation, focusing on fixing the survivor and not working on the community and ensuring that survivors can transition effectively into the community that they belong with to. So it's not just about reunification. Freedom as far as reintegration is concerned, is not just about returning people to their family. It's also about belonging. It's also about community and whether that community actually accepts them. I go back to how do survivors actually define freedom? How do they define this thing? How do they define rehabilitation, the integration, and what would be would they define it as, what would they want? And one of the things that came up for, for me was this idea of community, that community is important and not just the community that you come from, but communities that you belong to, communities that you choose. Again, I'll use a quote from the Yolred Project. I made some good friends while in captivity. It made me feel somehow better to know I was not alone. Some of these friends are still my friends today and we share a bond which is unique because of our shared experiences. It was sometimes hard to trust people, but we three friends always looked out for each other. You realize no one from home can come to help you. So you love your friends like your family. They protect and care for you. You laugh and joke with your friends, but sometimes you have, you have to hide these friendships. So it, when you look at this statement, the idea of family, survivors are redefining the idea of family, the idea of community, and the fact that shared experiences are really important. Something else that came up from the project and specifically from the Yolre project is the discussion around education being important. That the only way they could be free and could fully integrate and access uh, opportunities that were permanent was through long-term education. Land and housing as a permanent space and physical place to call home 
is also something that is important. There was a discussion around rent, the fact that once when you go back home and you still don't own the house that you live in, you still have fear of losing that home. And finally, economic empowerment is something else that stood out. The fact that survivors don't want to continue relying on other people. They want empowerment that actually takes them out of poverty. They want livelihood options that actually make it possible for them to participate and to take care of themselves. So for me, this, this whole concept of freedom is not complete without looking at how survivors actually define these things, define rehabilitation, define reintegration, and the fact that uh, things like reintegration are more about belonging than just physical families. So one of the things that uh, a friend of mine and that survivor leader, Dr. Min Dang, likes to say is that for the human trafficking sector, exclusion is a norm. Uh, the premise of international development work in general is that the communities you work with need empowerment. And you, as the development practitioner, is coming to teach, is coming to empower. The premise itself already lends itself to an inherent power difference that intentionally has to be challenged. And I say intentionally because it's not going to happen automatically. And it looks different in every situation. Uh, the AKN project really tried to overcome this challenge in different ways. The Build X project did this by ensuring that survivors who would never be consulted in architecture were consulted in different ways and their opinions, what they thought and everything actually implemented in design, which is something that is very unique. If you think about architecture, if you think about the fact how ar architectures work, working with survivors is not something that essentially is part of their day job or part of something that they do. But because inclusion was a priority and ethics were a priority in this project, they actually felt that it was important to do this. The other project that looked at this was also the Right Lab. The Right Lab project gave survivors the ability to write down stories. In storytelling, most of the time, what we see is survivors' stories being told by other people, being interpreted by other people. And in this case, for the rights lab, what they did is actually empower the survivors or actually give the survivors tools and, and, and space to be able to create these stories themselves. The truth is challenging power dynamics, especially that allows the inclusion of survivors, requires that those with power hand over power and not hand it over as an act of pity, but as an act of justice. It's an acknowledgement that the power that some of us hold comes as a result of privilege, privilege of where you were born, what you had access to, what knowledge the system considers valuable. The human trafficking sector, as I've said, has had survivors mainly participating from the sides, from the sidelines. So ethics are important, who is involved, who speaks, how do they speak, how are we thinking about issues of trauma, you know, are we trauma informed, are we thinking about culture when we're implementing projects, are we thinking about inclusion actively and actually taking steps towards that. In the AKN projects, one of the things that was very common was community-led projects as a part of the solution of bridging this gap and being more ethical. But working in communities comes with its own challenges and trust is one of those things. That because again, development has been inherently exclusive, 
trust has always been an issue. Uh, whether people trust you or not is really, really difficult because several people have come and basically abused that trust. Most of the AKN projects worked with local partners and local experts and not, did not just work with them uh, by handing over favors, basically worked with them by allowing them to set their agenda. And beyond that, beyond that, building their capacity as local experts. One of the projects that stood out for me in this a sense was the last land project, which basically worked with researchers and most of the researchers by the end of the project had their capacity. Basically most of them by the end of the project had more opportunities, received mentorship and participated in a more wholesome way. And as a result of that, that power dynamic between them and the lead researchers from the West was significantly reduced. Community-led projects require a lot of patience, require a lot of time. And for someone who's worked in project management, I realize that deadlines are important. I realize that donors actually want to be able to see results and see results at a specific time. When you're working ethically, when you're trying to work with communities and when you're trying to work in, uh, to be inclusive, being efficient in that way is not something that you can promise. And I have to give credit to the, AK, the flexibility and the nature of how most of these projects were built. It's in that they allowed that, they allowed space and room for uh, projects and communities and experts to actually involve, to take time and actually develop this project the way they should. Once we are ethical, how can we actually work on solidarity? And I think uh, if you know me, you know that ethical storytelling is one of the key things that I talk about. And the fact that we need to listen to everyone and we need to think about uh, who is on the table, who's writing, who's taking pictures, and whose story is actually being listened to. At an international scale, I think we need to actually reflect and change our intervention based on the reflections of survivors. Protection needs to change. Research needs to change. We need to acknowledge that we built a system that was exclusive and that did not have survivors' voices at the center. And therefore, for us to shift and actually change, we need to start by making room for survivors. I always give this as a challenge. Think about your job, think about what you're doing. What interventions do we need to make for a survivor to do your job? Then start doing that. If you are a researcher and you have a doctorate degree, what would it take to actually get survivors to have a PhD and to do research at the level that you're doing. I will highlight the fact that most of the AKN projects really, really placed survivors at the center and really focused on being ethical as a practice, being ethical and ensuring that they took the time to listen to give space, to give room, and to build capacity of survivors. Most of these projects asked the question of how can I step back as an expert and actually leave room, put survivors at the center, and allow them to lead. And for me, this is something that can be practiced everywhere for all the people that are working in this sector is something that can be done easily if we just start asking the question of how can we be more inclusive so that we can show solidarity with survivors. 